Well, good afternoon, everybody. I think uh, this is probably the second to last. I'm just in, I'm in the way of drinks and dinner for all of you. So not a problem. Um, so I'm, I'm Andy Shankler, Chief Product Officer of Deluxe. And I think we're going to cover some pretty interesting things. Uh, I'm pretty sure that between walking the floor over the course of the last two days and probably some of the conversations you've been listening to, Everybody talks about things from a niche perspective. They talk about, you know, whether it was like the IP delivery, they talk about from live capture, you know, any, any portion of the component. And cloud has basically become a thing of the past. There's no, nobody's really having a conversation anymore about whether we should move to the cloud. It's really just what percentage of our business has moved at this point in time. And the reality is, is that what we really need to struggle with is a complete end-to-end -end supply chain that allows you to facilitate the use of all of the pieces that we, that we talk about. We talk about how you know, broadcast engineers and video engineers are going to use things, but in the reality, most of the people that we're building things for are, are going to be too young to even know what an SDI port is. They're going to be too young to have ever seen patch panels before. They have a whole new way of thinking about the problem that we need to start solving for. And quite frankly, we're a pretty lazy industry, right? If you, if you think about the last 30 years, we had tape-based encoding, and then when we went to file-based encoding, all we did was take all of our workflows, cross out the word tape, write the word file, and said, done. And in reality, that's not done. It's a, you can now move to a non-linear way of working when you're file-based, and so why would you just simply replicate what you were doing in the tape-based world? And cloud is very much the same way. Everybody's kind of patting themselves on the back because they moved to Amazon or Microsoft or Google or whatever it is of the, you know, their choice. But the reality is, is all they've done is a lift and shift of their file-based workflows. And now we're starting to have the conversation about, well, how do I make use of virtualization? How do I make use of all of the cloud technologies that I just didn't have before? But they just ran into it without really thinking through what were all the changes that need to be made. And so I want to talk a little bit today about all those different aspects, all of the, you know, the buzzwords that we hear about, and just what the real impacts for migrating into these worlds are, and, and what's the impact of actually moving content through the cloud. So the first thing is, it's, it's a pretty interesting time for what's going on. It used to be really clear who was a content creator and who was a content distributor. It really wasn't a, a lot of gray area with that, right? And suddenly, it's very hard to, to tell who is who anymore, right? You have Netflix obviously spending more money practically than anyone else on original content, right? You have the studios in a consolidation view of the world, and, and, and while they're consolidating, they're actually making less content. And then you have a new tier of people, right, which we used to call prosumers, that are starting to have the ability to make content at a very high quality and be able to distribute it themselves. And those pre that presents all new challenges for us, right? They're, they're not going out and buying, you know, the world of digibetas and HD cams. They've never even known what those things were. So they're not trying to figure out how to transform their business. They're trying to figure out how do they push the envelope of monetization and how do we start answering questions for them about, I want to have my content available everywhere at the speed of a click. Right? And it's being made harder by things like Facebook Live, Instagram, you know, Snapchat. Everybody has gotten this, you know, I've got a movie studio in my pocket and I can go do anything I want. And you just think about, even in the last you know, couple months here, we've had World Cup, we've had the US Open, and there's been all sorts of craziness going on in regards to all the problems that they've suffered in terms of latency issues and the problems with live streaming. And that really gets us into the kind of the chaos of the current market, right? Just walking, this, this place is enormous, right? And you just walk these halls and you'll find 15 people standing next to each other that it's very difficult to determine what's the difference between any of the things that they do. And so what happens is, is that you basically have somebody that might have actually implemented one of everything and sometimes two or three of everything. And so you get this kind of chaotic, you know, chaos model of how the industry is actually performing their tasks. And we talk about it, and you see the complaints online, because consumers could care less that this problem exists, right? They're just like, I want immediate gratification. They want to see it right now. The fact that you know, streaming you know, a, a 4K uh, version of the World Cup to everyone at the same time had a, had a problem, how dare you? 
right? The fact that it only existed 15 minutes ago, right? That's, that doesn't matter to them, right? We've been doing space travel for 50 years, and every 15 years, there's a massive disaster within that industry, right? And they take a lot of care in what they do with it. We've been working on live streaming of 4K in relative time for about a second and a half, right? And yet there's an expectation by the market that we've got everything solved. And so when we talk about all of these bespoke pieces that we're working with, the real unifying piece for all of this is how do you plug everything together? How do you create a supply chain? How do you get predictability and consistency across all of the environments that you're working with? And that's really what we need to focus on in order to make this stuff become a reality. Unfortunately, we don't need half of the, the things that are out there all the time. There's preferences and people tend to make emotional buying decisions and things of that nature. But the reality is, is that what you want is consistency to get rid of this amount of chaos and create a really unified experience so that you don't need you know, super experts in every single field in order to be able to do the kind of things that we're talking about on scale. So that leads you to something that looks like this, right? This is an architecture overview of what Deluxe has built. Uh, and this is not a sales pitch, but just so that you understand kind of where, we, where we've kind of come at from the problem, which is it's a collection of, of a different set of aspects of looking at the problem. The first is, is that at the very top, you need a unifying interface to be able to deal with all of this stuff. The last thing you want to do is have 15 people within an organization have to look at 27 different screens and see them all a different way, right? You want everybody to be saying the same thing. We want to talk in the same nomenclature. You want to have a consistent taxonomy for the way that you store data, right? You don't want to have, like, let's just take an example of, like, a group of people doing editing for maybe news or sports or something like that. And when they're working on it, everybody labels it differently. How do you organize all of that? Right? That's a very simplistic kind of grounding logic for this entire thing. Once you start putting this stuff into the cloud and you start taking in content from thousands of contributors, if you don't have any consistency, you'll never be able to organize that information. You'll never be able to get that stuff out into the world. Below that are all the particular business functions that you might do, right? Everything from visual effects, coloring, editing, down to localization. The globalization of content, it is huge. We talk about all the time right now that there's so many more people creating content, but the fact of the matter is not only are they creating it, but it's going everywhere. And so people have now had to start to experience, how do I localize all of that content into 100 languages? What does that mean for compliance of all of those things? I can't just distribute everything to everywhere. There's sadly laws that we have to apply to, right? We have to adhere to all of these things. All of that needs to be dealt with. So then you get into these kind of this application tier. Within, within the architecture. And in the application tier, what you really want to do is you want to get rid of the monolithic beasts of the past. That is the killer, right? Everybody has been building these kind of siloed environments and that they are supposed to do everything for all time. And the reality is nobody can really do that. There's nobody who can do the full end-to-end -end in one single monolithic application. And so you start to break it apart and you allow them to do the core functionality that's important for a particular function. Now, as you kind of go dive into that, then you start to have to question, so how do I build applications that are not monolithic, but you know, bespoke in terms of their functionality, but still make it so that I can scale and I can be nimble without having to kind of constantly reiterate my work over and over again? And then that takes you into the microservices and the API layer. And microservices gets used an awful lot nowadays. We, we as I probably just as, as people, enjoy a new term and we just stick with it, right? We, blockchain is everywhere like cloud was two years ago, right? People don't even know what it is half the time, but they know they have to have it and everybody's running after it. Microservices are very much the same thing. And especially for developers and engineers, when they find something new that they love, they'll convince everybody that it is the one thing, only thing, and all things known to man should be built that way. And the reality is, is there's a balance. For everything, there's a right way to do something, right? And I tell you this from experience where, you know, regular database structures make a lot of sense for certain types of functionality. Not everything needs to be rebuilt from the ground up just because there's a new toy on the market. And yet, we find ourselves looking out and seeing people building entire end-to-end -end microservice architectures that if you get so micro and become so atomic with the function, it actually becomes exponentially harder 
to be able to do the work. And we'll go into that in, in a minute in terms of what that is. And then underneath all of that, you really want to be agnostic with regards to what kind of cloud computing you're using. There's a lot of conversations that go on all the time, whether you should be on public cloud, private cloud. I mean, let's just be honest. From a cloud perspective, cloud is just data center. There is no, there is no magic cloud, right? They're all just data centers. Each of the pl public cloud service providers have technologies that you can leverage. And so you're really, what you're really doing is choosing who has a software service stack within their environment that is the most manipulatable. It's the most uh, forward thinking. And how do you leverage those things? That's what's really being decided here. Everything else becomes, again, more of an emotional decision. Do you want to put your assets into an environment that you may not have complete control over? But most likely, even if you were doing a private cloud, you've probably leased space from a third party. You probably don't own the building. You probably don't own even, in many cases, the equipment that's in it. You're leasing some of the hardware that everything is sitting on. So you're just starting to make different economic choices around all of that. So going back to the microservices and open APIs, like anything else, one of the really important things is that, you know, we, as with anything, when you talk about something in a very kind of simplistic vacuum, right? If I told you, hey, I'm gonna develop something and I'm gonna use a test title to do something, and I type the word test and one thing comes up on a list, it's very simple, not really hard. And so you might see the engineers build the system to do a certain thing only for do, you know, having tested it with one or two assets in the system. Now, if you told them, but I need to do 10,000 of those a day, and you had to type in every single one of them, you'd want to kill yourself. You'd want to, you'd want to completely change the way you go about doing that. Well, building things in microservices is much the same way. The paradigm for how you develop has to change, right? Because software development and you know, kind of the agile methodologies have really been designed around teams of people doing things in conjunction with each other so that everything releases effectively at the same time. The benefits of microservices allow you to build everything at a different speed. So one person could be building a transcoding module at one speed, another person could be building a delivery module, and so on and so forth. The problem becomes is that if you have 30, 40, 50 different microservices within your architecture, every single one of them is running at a different pace. And because they're running at a different pace, the person who's doing a delivery may be dependent on something that the transcoding uh, microservice does, and they may be 10 steps out of sequence with them. So you suddenly need to rethink your entire project management philosophy about how to do that. And, it, and again, going back to what we were saying, not every single thing needs to be a microservice. There are certain things that are perfectly fine being a contained application, and there are other things that you need ultimate scalability. And people tend to get so caught up in the technology, they don't really ask the question, why am I doing this, right? Everybody will hide behind, well, scalability as if somehow everyone is building a Netflix that's gonna be 100 million users tomorrow. Not every single thing that you build is gonna have 100 million people coming on it tomorrow. So why do you need to build it in a way that has to scale if over the course of the next three years, certain functionality will just never leverage that much? You may not have that much concurrency going on in your environment. And so again, really important that what you're doing is you're making use of all of these services in a way that are what they were intended for. They give you really high fault tolerance. It, uh, it allows you to have an incredibly powerful environment that can sustain itself, right? You can start to deploy it in multiple regions. You have less failure, right? We were talking about the, the virtualization of, uh, of uh, you know, an IP-based infrastructure. This is key to that, right? It's, it's much more cost effective. But again, it's only cost effective if you do it for the right things and don't just do it for everything just because it's out there. So the next piece within all of this is enabling, uh, sorry, enabling the virtualized marketplace. And this, I really, I think the, the people who get it right more than all of us are pirates. Pirates have the most efficient supply chain on the earth. First of all, it costs nothing. Congratulations, pirates. Secondly, they have no money. So because they have no money, they have to make it the most efficient thing that you can do. We spend more time putting in layers and complexity and people into a process that three 12-year-olds have figured out how to do without any problem whatsoever. And so what we need to do is we need to borrow from these concepts, right? It's not like we're gonna do it 
without, you know, we're not going to steal, we're not going to do anything illegal, but we're going to apply the conceptual models around those things. And one of the first things that we have to do with that is all of the businesses out there are terrified of each other. They all act as competitors because that's what they are, but really everybody's frenemies. Right? Everybody needs to interact with each other constantly. And so opening up marketplaces so that people can actually compete with each other but still work with each other is incredibly important to making this work properly. That interactivity between all of these different environments so that if somebody chooses flavor A and flavor B, there really shouldn't be any reason why one person forces you into one environment versus another. In the past, there's been an entire philosophy around if you give me all of your assets, especially in the tape-based world, if you give me all your tapes and I store them in my facility, then because of the gravity of the fact that I have the physical asset with me, there's a tendency to do more work. That's not a thing anymore. That's not a problem that we have anymore. And so what we have to do is we have to design completely new ways of thinking about the problem. And you tend to see that even with RFPs and RFIs that are out there, right? People build and write those documents with a view of what the answer already is, right? The questions that they're asking in them are already written with an expectation that the answer is X. And they just want to know who can do X the right way. But in fact, if you think about the problem differently, you really need to go and challenge the entire way you think about this problem in the first place. And then you start getting into the data. And the data is more astronomically complex than all of the content that we're ever talking about at any given time. When you start from kind of the beginning of green lighting any production, no matter how big, whether it's a five minute short or a two hour feature, right, there's an enormous amount of information that we start to capture. You start to capture data from the lenses, you capture data from the cameras themselves, you capture dailies, things of that nature. And with each step through the process, it's getting more and more complex. It's an exponential growth. And here's an interesting way uh, from a statistical perspective to look at it. When you start getting down to the point of sending content out to different MVPDs, broadcasters, IP playout facilities, things like that, the number of combinations of assets and metadata that are required to send to each of those different facilities measure somewhere in the four quintillion range. And the way you get that is by saying, I may have a frame, you know, multiple frame rates I choose from, HD, SD, different audio channel configurations, different language configurations. The number of combinations of things that need to be decided at any given time is absolutely enormous. And that number is only growing given the fact that people now are starting to create content that allows consumers to choose their own paths. It allows for adaptive bit rates. There's, there's really no end to the size of the scale of that. And so immediately what comes to mind is AI. Everybody starts to say AI is going to be the solution to this problem. Most of the things that you see AI doing right now are either people are very excited about finding people at weddings or they find Coke cans that they want to turn into Pepsis. I don't see a business model for either of those, but I'm thrilled that people are finding people at royal weddings that happen once a decade. The real problem that we have is the underlying issue of all of the content flowing through all of our ecosystems, right? When you get all of these bespoke assets that are coming in, when you get you know, a piece of video and then six months later you get an audio version, how do you know it's actually associated to the video that you stored in the first place? How do you know it's conformed? When you get subtitles, how do you know those are conformed? How do you know they're for the right version? All of that stuff tends to be an incredibly manual human process. And where does everybody jump to? They jump to, oh, we're going to auto-translate. We're going to jump all the way to the end, the future state of the end of the localization part of the business. That's lovely. That's right. That's the right, that's the right end point. But there's problems right now, and there are legacy library catalogs that have to be dealt with. And so when we look at the transformation of this entire business, it doesn't need to be, you know, kind of the Star Trek version of stuff. We just need to focus our attention in the right areas and make sure that we're looking at it holistically from the entire ecosystem. So that just gives you kind of a good overview taste of everything that's involved in kind of the, a real kind of cloud view of what's necessary for content distribution and, and content creation. Anybody have any questions? Because I was, you know, super detailed, so there shouldn't be any questions. But. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate the time.